السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. You know how this works, yeah? السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. إن الحمد لله والشكر لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد. Before I start, I need to make a retraction. Um, yesterday when I spoke to you, <coughs> and as I was making my way out, uh, one of the brothers, may Allah Rabbul Izzah bless him and guide him and guard him, um, stopped me and asked with regards to the story of Umar that um, I mentioned yesterday and the burying of his daughter. Um, and the story is in some of the, the biographies of the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Um, and I took it from that and came and spoke about it. But last night when the brother drew my attention to it, I went and researched, and the chain of narrations is faulty. Um, so it's not an authentic narration uh, to us, and it has been something that has crept into some of the books. Um, and I do wish to thank uh, my brother for, for bringing that to my attention, and I think that is a very mature way to deal with it. Um, because we are humans and we will err, we will make mistakes and no one is perfect. Uh, and when a mistake is made um, uh, and you find it, be adab in uslub, come and just say, listen, akhi, um, I think you have, um, you know, you might have overlooked this point or, or made the wrong statement. Um, and predominantly, um, although at times it might be challenged, but the person will go and research it at home and then um, once they find the fact, um, you know, uh, it's easy enough to, to put a retraction in place. So may Allah Rabbul Izzah accept from us and from you. Um, of the signs of the Day of Judgment, the Prophet Wasallam said, one of the things that will happen is Muslims will greet only the people they know. Listen to me. Greetings will only be extended to the people you know. And yet the order of the Rasul was to greet those who you know and those who you don't know. I will build this into my talk later, but right now because you've just had a, had a long session, I want to ask you to do something for me. I want each person here to greet someone that they don't know. And I know it's daunting for you when I say that because, oh my God, I have to get off my seat again. You know, I understand. But uh, I want each person here to get up, just get up, find the person, not the one you came here with, just and, and greet a proper greeting. You know, Salam alaikum, how are you? I am so and so. Introduce yourselves. Uh, and, and stop being shy. Alhamdulillah, you've all come here for the right purpose. Uh, Bismillah. MashaAllah. Takbir. That wasn't the rule. Takbir. No, there was three. Takbir.
I'll come back to, to that exercise later and why we, we did it. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in a hadith narrated by Hudayfa radiallahu an that trust, amana, was revealed from the heavens and seeded in the hearts of men. Um, you know, the sense of trustworthiness was sent from Allah Rabbul Izza and seeded into the hearts of men. Then the Quran and the Sunnah came and it nourished and cultivated this sense of trustworthiness until it became apparent and manifested in society. So your prophet is known as Sadiqul Amin, the truthful person who is trustworthy. And Islam brought about a culture in which a lot of emphasis was placed on this issue of honoring the trust. So the Prophet Sallallahu told us the signs of a hypocrite are three. Like three things, if, the, if you know, if it, uh, signs, if it is in you, you have a sign of hypocrisy. One of those three was when you are trusted with something, you betray the trust. And the scholars of this religion, and it is such a privilege to be part of this deen, say that if a person gives you a thousand, for in your case, ringgits, and 50 notes, you know, so this 50 ringgits, uh, notes, and um, all together it comes to a thousand, and he tells you, listen brother, can you keep this for me? Till I return, I'm going overseas, keep this thousand for me. You are not allowed to spend a 50 note, you know, a 50 ringgit, and replace it with another 50. Although financially it makes no problem, he gave you a thousand, give him a thousand bucks back. I'll use bucks because we are from Australia. And I, I, my tongue is getting stuck on this ringgit issue, you know, so khalas, we'll, we'll, we'll use bucks. So if a person gives you a thousand bucks and tells you, listen, here's the money, you're not allowed to go and spend the fifty dollars, take another fifty from your pocket, put it on top of that and say, here's your thousand back. You keep the same notes and return it to him. Do you see the insistence of Islam on a society having trust? And in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu says, four signs. If they're in one person, he's a hundred percent munafiq, a hypocrite. And one of those signs is that when you trust him, he betrays the trust. And the verse of the Quran, Allah Rabbul Izzah says, that Allah commands you to return the trust back to its people. And there's, you know, a dozen different ways that this works and it transcends all spheres of life. For example, you're running an institution. Those kids that come to you are an amana. They're a trust. The parents... Can you imagine, subhanAllah, the miracle? Every morning, the parents drop off at your door their most valuable possession, their children, for you to take care of till the afternoon, to teach and educate at your behest. And imagine you don't take that trust seriously, you have betrayed a generation. So now imagine in this institution, you need a teacher or you need a principal. 
And then you've got people applying, one of them is your cousin, one is a normal person, one is very qualified, one is underqualified, and so on. As part of fulfilling the trust, you're supposed to give the position to the one that deserves it, not the one that is closest in lineage to you. Do you understand? So trust transcends all of life, and Islam brought about a system in which trust flourished. So that at home, there was trust between husband and wife. Kids trusted their parents. You know the story, a lady was in the presence of the Prophet wasallam. She told her child, come I will give you some dates. But she wasn't intending to give the dates. She just wanted the kid to cuddle. So the Prophet said, You have made an undertaking. You better fulfill it. She said, Even as a joke? He said, Even as a joke. Do you see, if parents are like that, we are going here, we are doing this, and they do it, the child starts to trust the word of the parents. Do you understand me? And husband and wife, there's trust developing between them. In society, you work in an organization, you're very safe and comfortable that I won't get backstabbed by my colleague. You know, he's not there to push me out of the way to get the job. There's trust in society. And there's trust between the civilians and government. So society flourishes. And the annals of Muslim history, you will not find Muslim governments spying on their people. Because there was trust. And when trust flourished, civilizations flourish. It's easy to do business now. Because... The person has come, he wants a thousand dollars, he's taken, and you know, you give it because you, you know he's a trustworthy person. But, and through that, Islam grew even to your countries. You know, no wars happened here in Indonesia, Malaysia, in these parts. Islam came to you because Muslim merchants came here. Muslim businessmen came here. And when you started to deal with them, you realize that these people are very different. They're very trustworthy. They will not break their word. They will not betray a trust. So much so that there are stories of the scholars of the past. One of them had a, had a shop, a big shop, in which he used to sell clothing and materials. And one of the materials on one of the shirts had a defect. There was a defect on one, of the, on, on one of the products. So he told his worker, listen, when you sell this, highlight the fault. Tell the person, it's got this problem before he buys it. So the sheikh went to pray. When he came back, he said, how was the good? A few people came. What did you sell? Oh, I sold that, that garb, you know, that material, that, that clothing. He said, did you tell the person the defect, the fault? He said, no, I forgot. So he goes, oh, you ruined me. You ruined me. So some of the, uh, you know, Mu'arrikhin, those who write his biography say, he donated the whole, the whole shop as sadaqa. Why? Because, you know, his worker had broken the trust. So he goes, I don't want this wealth. Take it. Give it to Allah, Rabbul Izzah. I'm afraid of the punish. Do you see a society like that? There's not another community on earth that could give examples like these. It is only in your legacy. So Muslims became preferred business partners. 
You know, if you were looking for a business partner, you would want a Muslim. They became preferred employers. If you wanted to be employed by someone, you wanted that to be Muslim. You know, one of the Ashab, Subhan al-Khaliq, was scolding his servant. They used to have slaves in those days, and he was scolding him. So the Prophet saw it, and they say his face changed in anger. And he said, your Lord has more authority over you than you have over that servant. So the man was so remorseful that they say from that day onwards, when you used to see them walk in the shops, the master and the servant used to wear the same garb. You know, he used to feed him like he used to feed, like himself. Clothe him as he used to be clothed. Seat him as he used to be seated. Why? Because the dean taught that. But the Prophet wasallam, in the hadith warned that one night the man will go to sleep and Allah will take away trust from his heart again. So that only a trace of it remains. And then he will sleep a second, like another night. And all traces of it will be taken out. So that, you know when you walk and your foot hits an amber, this is the hadith, the, your, hit, your foot hits a bit of burning coal, it blisters, but there's no liquid in the blister. It's just a bit of air bubble. So only that will be left. Like we say, the web will be there, but no spider inside. Do you understand? The sh but there won't be any effect of trust left. So can you imagine when there's no more trust and we're going towards that? Then the husband doesn't trust the wife. The wife doesn't trust the husband. What a calamity. Can you imagine checking each other's phones? Checking their text messages, emails, Facebook. Why has she liked you? Trust goes. Kids don't trust their parents. And what a colossal calamity when a child has no one to trust at home. I talk a lot about this because to me, the biggest da'wah and the most important contribution that we can make is to ensure that we bring to the world a better generation than ours. It's the best da'wah you can do. So I advise, although I am not its ahl, although I am not qualified for it, but I find it as a responsibility, so indulge me in that. Can you imagine a child who doesn't trust the wisdom of mom and dad. So something bad happens at school. So the child keeps it in and suffers silently because you overreacted. Because you didn't pay attention. Because you didn't have time. Because you didn't have know-how. Because you are inadequate. But the child is damaged because he or she can no longer trust the parent. So I'll give you an advice, my dear brothers and sisters. Make this a rule at home. That doesn't matter what your child has done. If they come to you and tell you, you will not get them in trouble. You will find a solution for them. You must communicate that explicitly to your child. That listen, sweetheart, you're a child, you will make mistakes. Doesn't matter what your mistake, come to me first. And when they come to you, make sure you don't betray the trust Muslim. Make sure you don't overreact Muslim. Make sure you don't push your own son and your daughters in the arms of others Muslim. Be intelligent. 
be emotionally intelligent, manage situations better. Young girls are suffering in secret relationships because they have no one to talk to. Being compromised day in, day out because you couldn't react appropriately. The stories are endless, but you get what I mean. If trust disappears, society will fall apart. You're at work and some of you can vouch for this. You walk or you write an email so carefully because it's a hostile environment, someone will take your seat. I, you know, I deal with people uh, in business and, and so on. And I notice some of them so disingenuous. Write what they do not mean, mean what they do not write. Because there's no trust. And if you've noticed I'm a frank person, I, I, I speak frankly. So, trust is the foundation of society. And imagine if an environment is created where authorities do not trust the citizens. So it becomes all our collective responsibility to create a society in which trust is its bedrock and foundation. And in that regards, I give an advice to my audience here and those who will see this um, online and, and to those who are in positions of authority and power, make it a strategic goal for your nations and organizations to inculcate and incorporate trust from a young age all the way to the most senior authority in the land. Then you will excel. Excellence is not just about you know, the physical competencies and resources and all that. A lot of it is intrinsic. So imagine you create or succeed in creating children who are trustworthy. Organizations do professional developments in how to build trust. Governments work on building trust with their civilians or within themselves. And all of a sudden, you stick to the tenets of trust. You become a trustworthy nation, organization, civilization. So look at it as an overall picture. Governments, when they want allies, they want people they can trust. So you become a preferred ally. Organizations look for organizations they can work and they can trust. You become a preferred business partner. Uh, I know people who have a lot of passion. They are burning with energy to do things. They have great ideas. They don't have money. They don't have capital. And I know people who have no energy and no ideas, but have a lot of money. Imagine if this one trusted that one, and this one was trustworthy, and that one was trustworthy. Capital, ideas, and energy come together. It will revolutionize industry. So there's two things missing. And, and Allah send the choicest salawats on the Rasul. Two things missing. Trust and know-how, uh, you know, knowing each other. So that's why the Prophet said, say salam to those you know and those you don't know. Network Muslims. Get to know, you don't know where the khair lies. Get to, and when you greet, don't just greet, you know, greet. Get to know the person. Say a few words. And through this, societies improve and develop. 
So that's why I got you. Listen, get out of your little comfort zone of your cousin and your nephew. Get out. Meet some others. The people here, insha'Allah, are people of khair. They have come for the sake of Allah. In here, there will be business opportunities. Grab it. But before you do anything, I want you to do me a favor. Inside you, say this to yourself. Say, I pledge that from this moment on, I will not betray a trust. Because I can't hear what's in your hearts. So let's do that loudly. <laughs> Brother Kamal, is that fair? Allah bless you, Ya Rabbi. So we'll do this as we do. I pledge. And don't say it if you don't mean it. You know, I'm not going to go back to Australia. Everyone pledge. It doesn't change anything. So, but seriously believe it. I pledge that after today, which means including today, I will not betray a trust. May Allah Rabbul Izzah protect you, guide you, and guard you. Uh, and a most important trust, listen to me Muslims, and this comes into the signs we're talking about in business. The Prophet said in a hadith alayhi afdal salatu wa tammu taslim that a time will come near the hour, as in near the day of judgment, where you will greet only the ones you know. And second, that business will flourish as an increase, so much so that a husband will allocate business responsibilities to his wife. Obviously, this wasn't done in those days. Although there was business women like Khadija, but the predominant culture was different. And today, we live in a global village in which, subhanallah, I am in Australia. When I have a phone problem with my phone, I call the helpline and someone in India answers. They do. And the strangest thing is they pretend to be Australian. <laughs> and that, that, uh, the, and I, so I know they're Indian. So I ask them for their name. So they give me an Aussie name. Uh, point is it's becoming closer. Collaboration is increasing between nations. And today a sister will sit in her house buy a product from another country, sell it to someone else in another country, because that's the nature of business today. And the prophets, and a lot of people uh, are going into, you know, and, and husband and wife look at it as an opportunity to become independent and have our own little business, where me and you can be together. So, do you understand me? Whether it's a little shop or a business at home or whatever, um, women are getting involved in business too. Now, this brings me to an issue which I want to join the issue of Amana with this one. If mom and dad are too busy at work, the child has no one to go to. So my advice to you Muslims is make sure in your desire to excel or survive, because for some it's survival, some it's, it's going to the next level, don't sacrifice the child. Because that child is an amana. It is a gift of God. It is an amana for you to bring up 
to the best of your ability and hopefully to his or her fullest potential. And I have a few minutes on the, on the clock here. I just want to digress here for a moment or two. We often talk about rights of parents. The respect owed to them, the reverence that is due to them, how we are supposed to behave towards them, and all that is valid. But we rarely talk about the rights of the child. And Muslims, the child has a right or rights upon you. And the rights of the child start the day where you're looking for a, for a father or a mother for that future child. Do you understand what I'm saying? The day when you start wanting to get married and you're looking for a husband if you're a sister or you're looking for a wife if you're a brother, there, a man of that child starts then. Who did you choose as the future mother of that child and who did you choose to father that child? Do you understand me? So whilst you sit there considering the curliness of the hair and the thinness of the nose and the thickness of the lip, also consider who will be the mother of this Muhammad and who will be the father of this Fatima. And what will they bring, what value will they add to the life of this child? I speak to my students and I know, you know, the, what is cool in the mass media today and who is, you know, the, the, the hip person and so on. And our students follow them. You know, they're obviously affected by, by mass media and by social media and all the rest of it. So then I ask them this question. Because at the stage of attraction, yeah, they're attracted to that image. Do you want to be with that person? Yeah, they would want to be with that person because they've made a demagogue out of the person. Then the question that brings reality home is, would you like that person to be the father of the future Muhammad and the future Fatima? And then they freeze. Ah, oh, him. Do you understand young Muslim, male Muslim, female Muslim, and the olders are looking at me with daggers. That, when you're choosing, and may Allah bless your choices, one of the aspects to think about is what type of a father will he be? And what type of a mother will she be? What values does she have to come and give to my child? And what values does he have to come and give to my child? Or will, will it be, you know, the only thing that the father has to teach or the mother has to teach is how to dress fashionably and how to be attractive and how to allure and how to put your makeup and how to, how to be, uh, do you understand? Is that what you're marrying to bring to the next generation or are you bringing someone into your house or going into someone's house who will be like the mother of Malik and the mother of a Shafi'i rahimahullah and the mother of Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah? Do you know? All of them single mothers. And they produce giants. You know Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. He was an orphan at the very, you know, a single mom brought him up. And not only brought him up, she prepared the curriculum for him. She decided, come Shafi'i, time to learn language. Time to learn fiqh. Time to learn adab. And when she put him as a student, she said, listen, learn his manners before you learn his ilm. Embody his character. Do you want, they made giants. So will you marry someone who will make a giant 
or will you marry someone who will take a giant and shrink him to nothing? Potentials that could reach the heavens buried under the sand. Death has come and they have achieved nothing. May Allah Rabbul Izzah guide and guard you to do what is khair in this life and in the next. My brethren and sisters, the signs are, are many. Um, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught them to us. In my understanding, to increase our Iman when it happens, but at the same time to prepare for it and strategize for it. Because when Allah Rabbul Izzah gave you a brain, He expected you to use it. So we have challenges which we know are coming. It would be naive of us as a nation or a civilization not to prepare for them. May Allah Rabbul Izzah grant you the capacity to face the challenges um, of the future. And may Allah Rabbul Izzah ease in your tests and your burdens and bless you and bless, you and bless your country and your families. Um, I have to rush to the airport as I am flying out. It has been a pleasure. Um, being with you, may the heavens guide and guard you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.